All right, everybody. Thanks for you know. Thanks for having me tonight, it's Donald and uh, Christian. It's interesting. I'm from I'm from New York, and I think I've been to Dublin about five or six times in the past couple of years. You know, all regarding the topic tonight around network automation. So it's just for one, I love Dublin. Most importantly, I come from the United States, where we have great buffalo wings. An elephant and castle in Temple Bar has like the best buffalo wings to, to die for. So I'll be back to you as much as possible. <laughs> but uh, okay, cool. So a few things for tonight on on who I am. So basically, my background is traditional network engineering, network operations. Right. I spent time at uh, Cisco, you know, years ago. I spent time at your traditional reseller integrator and you know, talking about Cisco transitioning back in 2012 and 13, really in 14 was really the shift in my career when they announced something called 1PK. Now it's now it's going on maybe you know seven or eight years ago, which was the first SDK for a network device. Right, it's very common for an iPhone or Android to have an SDK. And so back then I kind of had the opportunity to, to really experiment and learn about what that meant for networking, working with you know, Python, C, and Java. And it was really eye-opening, because at the time, as an industry, we were very much focused around, around open flow and control plane type stuff. And I think it really kind of brought to light the issue with manageability and, and operations. And from that, 2014, Network to Code uh, was born. And for the past four and a half, five years, I spend my time really focused around network automation in the context of operations and really trying to drive out the manual interactions that uh, enterprises, uh, cloud companies that have with just that traditional uh, operations to reduce all those inefficiencies. So what I'll talk through tonight is just kind of, you know, a few slides around, you know, what we're seeing out there, you know, going from what we're seeing here is being very traditional network operations, meaning we're managing devices you know, VSSH. This is still, even you know, as a company, we engage with some of the biggest companies in the world, and you know, the truth is that the majority <coughs> of folks out there um, still use, use SSH to manage devices. We talk about scaling network operations. Today, what we're really talking about, independent of automation, is really trying to still hire as networks grow, become more complex. But you know, what we're really trying to you know, is, is pivot that now change that conversation to talk about, well, what is the play network automation has within a network, right? Even publicly, it's oftentimes talked about within the context of the data center, right? Most of uh, the work that we do as a company, it's actually been quite a bit in, in the campus, right? Layer four to layer seven services, you know, firewalls, load balancers, and things like that, right? So it's, it's actually been a little bit, you know, less uh, data center. But as, as we see you know, folks getting started with network automation to try to achieve better operations, you know, some of the things that, you know, that we see around, I tried to change the font to make it you know, you know, good in the back. So but some of the you know, things that we're seeing is like there's one or two network engineers that you know, might spearhead things you know, with an organization. Right? They might have some ad hoc Python scripts, Perl scripts, you know, maybe example playbooks, you know, whatever it might be. But you end up kind of starting with a small pocket of engineers, really spearheading, you know, seeing the value. Then you end up with, you know, engineer one on the left, engineer two on the right, with you know different pockets of automation, you know, no integration uh, between them at all. Then you still have part of the team, right, stuck with the traditional uh, CLI, right. So this this obviously isn't the way forward, but it oftentimes is a good learning path to experiment to see what actually is possible. So the, you know, one point is to be cognizant of really trying to decouple a, a learning path, personal learning path versus you know, the path forward for holistic network operations. Okay, so as we see this happening, like there is you know, common approaches as, you know, as we see on the left. And really, oftentimes, there might not be peer review or code review or just getting feedback. Now, we'll say more importantly, it is very much true that you know, the networks you know, must stay up you know, first, and, first and foremost, but you want to think about as you deploy network automation, it shouldn't be having an ad hoc script or equivalent for every given workflow. You kind of you know, look at things more as a, a platform first approach. We'll always talk about the differences of something being a power tool to help you maybe on a change on the weekends versus a platform, something of which 
all network automation could in theory funnel through, right, for historical logging, tracking, and, and things like that. So what I'll do now is you know, take a step back. I want to look at just a very common manual uh, workflow. Because we always talk about automation, where to get started, you know, maybe we should you know, gather serial numbers for renewal smart net. Maybe we should gather neighbors and, and plot them. But when we think about making a change on the network as one type of automation, before I dive into this, keep in mind automation has many aspects of it. A lot of our clients will get started with read-only automation, right? taking in data, ingesting data, maybe writing it to Confluence in a wiki, or maybe doing a compliance check. Right, a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, less risky there to get started. But when we think about making a change, right, it's usually a little bit more in a structured environment than just logging and making the change. Right, it could be if there's an ITSM platform. Right, tonight we're talking about a service now, but it could be Remedy. You know, it could be just a tool that you go in and create a change request, and you know, based on the environment, maybe there's a method of procedures document that is pre-built that an operator or engineer should follow to talk about the change itself, maybe the risk it poses, maybe talk about the rollback plan, those sorts of things. And when we engage with clients, now it's just a matter of, you know, is there, for one, is there even a run book or a mop on, on each individual change that exists, or maybe for common changes? And then when we talk to senior architects in the organization, it exists, but you know, they, they've done the change you know, so many times, it doesn't even make sense to waste the time on filling out you know, the mop for the change. Right, so let's say it all happens, then the change change begins. We might execute some show commands, gather, you know, five, ten, twenty, whatever, you know, whatever it might be. You know, maybe one change you might gather five, maybe the next week you're feeling a bit better, you gather eight, right? It's all a matter of how oftentimes how we're feeling during the change to know like what show commands are gonna get gathered, right? Then you make the change, then gather the same show commands again, and maybe you forget one or forget two. But this is kind of really showing you know, about six steps, and you know we could inter interweave you know smaller, more more micro steps. But this is you know kind of a very common thing you know, that we see, and usually there are some sort of run book or procedural document that exists, you know, even if it is at a at a higher level to share within a given team. So we look at this kind of workflow. You know, should we start automating this workflow, right, or should we be striving for something greater, right? This is, you know, for the most part, not overly complex to get started with, talking about gathering show commands, maybe comparing show commands, things like that. Then we'll pose the question, you know, don't we really want some complex workflow that talks about CI, CD, infrastructure as code, you know, versioning, you know, versioning things within maybe a tool's uh, DSL with YAML files and you know, changing data and database to trigger a change, right? This is this is we'll say a little bit more of a complex environment. But there's you know, there's a balance of where to spend time initially, knowing where it could take you in in the future, right? This as an example, we'll go through this, but this is showing what something could look like still at a higher level, but making the same change from service now, being able to you know support things like automated testing through a CI CD pipeline. Right? A lot of this is very common in the developer space, but still fairly new in the network space. So if we take a step back, kind of you know, get started going back to a more basic workflow or going straight for the traditional infrastructure as code CI CD pipeline, you know, what do we do? Again, personal feeling, get started. There's no better time than probably a couple years ago or tomorrow to, to get started no matter how small or how large of a problem that, you know, that it's gonna be longer term. But what we really wanna do is, is really have the message, you know, get started, right? Starting with simple workflows is really gonna make a difference in you know, the big picture as things are, you know, as things are uh, pursued. So what I'm gonna do now is kinda walk through what I'm gonna demo. So I'm gonna show some of this live uh, tonight. Hopefully the wireless for me you know, stays uh, holding strong. But so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how we can make a change through various mechanisms, right? So ServiceNow, very popular ITS, ITSM tool, IT service management, again, it could be Remedy. So ServiceNow is gonna track all of our tickets. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna issue a network change down to Cisco CSR 1000V devices directly from ServiceNow. We're going to make the same change directly from, from Ansible, right? Very common platform uh, from Red Hat in the open source space. And then added, but we're gonna throw in Slack there as well to be able to issue a chat command from Slack to trigger the same exact workflow.
Okay. Now, what's very common is what I'm showing here, where as, as you know, our clients and enterprises try to tackle these problems, you actually may have multiple entry points to the network, which now you might have the same workflow be triggered from Ansible and at work and fail from service now. Really kind of you know, prevents us from moving faster. Right? So what we're gonna do is shift this architecture into something like this, where we're, we're gonna leverage in this demo, Ansible Tower as the main focal point into the network. And then riding above tower using the tower API we're going to communicate from ServiceNow going into Ansible and then from Slack going into Ansible. And then we can also obviously log into Ansible to, you know, to make that change. So we're going to see three, you know, three different ways to execute you know, that same workflow. And for here, we'll talk about basic changes to night interfaces, uh, VLANs, and so forth. But it could really be you know, any, any sort of change, right? So just keep in mind that I always bring up consumability. I want to keep that in mind as you think about network automation internally. You know, I do think it's on us as network engineers to figure out our customers internally. Right? Is it a help desk? Is it a systems group? Is it a developer group? Is it a data center team? Right? On on who are we actually doing doing work for? And could we give them access or give ourselves access? To do things more simpler, right? So we're going to see different interfaces for the same job, and you know I, I believe that if we deploy network automation tooling, the best out there, open source, commercial, whatever it is, if it's not used, it's really a lose lose, right? Usually network management is always an afterthought, and so now it's really with open APIs that exist on all these platforms, it, it, it is a matter of finding out the best user interface to trigger a, a given a given job. Right, so now what we're going to do now is look at what that same workflow looks like. Very focused, we'll say, on ServiceNow for now. So we're going to open that change request, and that request is going to have all the data it needs all the time. Executing show commands will be mapped to that change. Right, so if it's five or ten or twenty, whatever should be gathered, they're always going to be gathered every time because it's going to be pre-built within. You know, we'll just call it the automation engine. Making of the change happen repeatedly. Consistently every time, show commands again, compare the show commands, right? It's always going to happen. And then attach these results to, to a ticket, right? And they'll also see this go through Slack as well, okay? Now again, all of this is the foundation to get to something, we'll say, a bit more complex. And here we're showing the same architecture, really two different user personas. On the top right, you know, we see a user, we're calling it self-service through service now, but the same platform we can call it as infrastructure as code. Now the engineer is going to be leveraging really directly working with GitHub and Tower right in this case. So you kind of have best of both worlds here with really targeting and you know, thinking about the, the user audience of the workflow that we're trying to, to get across. All right, cool. So what I'm going to do is jump into to a live demo. All right, so again, so what we're really going to show is, is just what we discussed, leveraging combination of, of Ansible as the main engine to the device and looking at both ServiceNow and, uh, and Slack as the way we can trigger and take inputs from a user to trigger that job, okay? So let's open up, you know, we have, this font size is okay in the back, enlarge it pretty, pretty good. So right now, if we're in Slack, you know, Slack is, you know, chat program, you know, pretty popular these days. We have similar demos for WebEx teams actually, but we have uh, chat commands pre-built for Slack, right? And oftentimes these can be done communicating to a bot or in general slash commands in Slack. Right, so when I type slash, I'm gonna see a pop-up of commands I can run directly from chat, right? So we'll say slash net and we're gonna see a bunch pre-built, okay? So if we take one like, let's say add, add VLAN, slash net add VLAN, we're gonna see a pop-up that's really being sourced from chat, okay? So we'll see our inventory, we can select, you know, maybe our Nexus device here, you know, we're gonna put VLAN, you know, VLAN name, you know, let's just put, you know, maybe, you know, Dublin INOG VLAN, take the risk of doing it in real time, you know, we'll say VLAN ID uh, 200. So when we click submit, and the server's in the US, so a little bit of latency here, so now we're gonna say I'm logging as John Smith. You know, stand by, stand by John Smith. I'm gonna currently go add this VLAN to, to that switch. 
Now, in the context of what we're describing, if we went back to the architecture diagrams, this is actually sourcing from chat, going to Ansible, and Ansible recognizes there's no open change yet in service now, right? So even though this is happening in real time, we can click this link and it'll take me directly to service now. So this opened the ticket in real time that we can now, can now track. So if, if we scroll down, we're gonna look at, we have the data that we just entered in our ticket notes. And now in our notes here, we are gonna see this start to uh, take place. And so building configuration playbook is running. Right now, if I jump back to my Ansible terminal, I'd be able to, we'd be able to see the job running. We'll see a green blinking light take, saying this job is now in progress, All right? So if we look at this, we're now gonna see in chat our pre-change show command, show VLAN brief. We're gonna see that wasn't, that wasn't there. And now we're building change in progress, building the config see that all via chat and now what we're going to see is in a few seconds you know we're going to see um, post change post change come up with that with that vlan so this was sourcing that change directly from from slack still being tracked in in service now we have a lot of poses in in the playbook for speaking over it but if we were to come in now to uh, service now actually on that note I'm gonna go back to that change to show something real quick. This should be the last one that we opened. If we go back into notes, we're still, we still have that output, right? So that's being sent back into the actual uh, service now ticket as well as, as well as chat. Help desk, popular one. Again, this is ideally if you have Jack IDs around the campus, right, for help desk meaning, might not know the actual host name of the switch, IP address, right, things like that. So we'll just say, maybe it should be an IP phone or a guest user, you know, whatever it might be, All right? So we'll just say, because I said so, we'll put that in here. <laughs> so, and right now for the demo, what we've done, but this is still true in the enterprise space, is it pre-approved or not, right? Through ITIL standards, and if it's something that happens all the time, now it's automated, we could do a pre-approved change or not, right? So if we did pre-approved, click submit, it's really no different than, you know, than what we just looked at. The difference of if we don't check that box, we would then have to log in as a different user to, to approve it, okay? So as that gets kicked off, let's, let's do one come back here to our tickets. And the VLAN, looks like it was closed timer is a little bit longer than, you know, than expected. But we have the post change going back to the first change that we started. We'll see, we'll see the same exact thing. Now, even if we come back to, to any of these workflows, all being tracked in Slack, and there's toggles. If it's, if it's too verbose in chat, where we can kind of fix the verbiage and, and what makes sense. These can even be DMs, right? If you don't want to go to a public channel, right? And in all of these, we can trigger them from Slack. Right now for, for us, anything from Slack is real time. Anything from service now you have the option. Is a change required or, or not? I'll show that one in just a second, right? So if we did one more of these demos, there's also to retrieve data, right? So if we were to say, get facts, facts about a device or things like OS version, maybe neighbors, right? You would still define what facts are, but in this demo, you know, we're gonna say, you know, get facts of a, of a given device. We'll just say our Cisco CSR router. We'll say CSR1, you know, click submit. Again, our, we'll say our bot now that's integrated to, to chat is gonna to go to the device. We really issue a number of show commands. You get, get them aggregated. And then what we should see here in just about 30 seconds to a minute, because even this is happening through is happening through Ansible, right? So even historical logging and tracking is still is still all there, right? So we got the facts back. We see our neighbors on Giggy One, Giggy Two, Giggy Four, OS version, you know, serial number, and this is where opportunities are really up to you, up to us to figure out, you know, what are the right uh, chat commands. As an example, maybe it's getting data, maybe it's validating compliance, maybe it's issuing show commands natively, triggering predefined jobs, and at the same time, you know, we have various things. Again, it could be switch port, you know, it could be you know, for a network person, hosting of the device, interface, and so on, 
to make the change. All right, so this is sort of what I have for tonight, but really just thinking differently about network operations. In the open source space, it's very common to talk about infrastructure as code, but I mean, I'll say supporting a lot of enterprises, I right, still don't want to lose track of change requests, auditing, historical tracking, and things like that. So this, you know, combining, you know, tracking capabilities of ITSM plus an automation tool really adds a lot of value to, you know, what can be done with network automation. Cool. Thank you.